Actually, I want to apologize if, if my talk has is a bit long on anticipation and a bit short on using it to characterize deposition at Chattopaya. Um, as you'll see, I'm experimenting with some new methodologies to um, address the temporal structure of depositional sequences. And I'd really hope to have some preliminary results to share with you as part of the talk. Um, a combination of pushing things to the last minute and my laptop being in its death throes at the moment um, means I don't have a whole lot of money to put where my mouth is there uh, at the moment. But what I'll set out to do is to frame a problem uh, pertinent to the session aims and sketch out how I'm anticipating that I'll address that um, in the next coming month or two. So my aim is to understand how depositional events help constitute built space, lived space. Um, I'm particularly interested in the embedding of material culture of, of objects in chattel hayek houses, um, and particularly in cases where these deposits um, don't seem to fit any really neat intuitive typology, where it's very much a chaotic assortment of things that um, is difficult to work with in a sort of static sense. Um, so I'll talk generally about doing space or making space um, and the role that anticipation has to play in that, um, and then talk specifically about sequential association rules analysis that uh, um, it's a mathematical way of, of assessing links between events and sequences of events. Um, and I'm toying with this as a way to get at anticipation, possibility space, and, and the temporal structure of spaces at Chattel Hayek. So a basic premise of all this is that space is not static. It's not a thing. Um, it is constituted by <coughs> things, but it's not a thing. It's not a medium. Um, space is something that's inherent to and emergent from action and interaction. Um, it's a bit closer to what Dole says here. Um, it's a verb to space, and that's all. So things like extensivity, distance, closeness, coherence, dispersal uh, come about as materials interact. Um, as, for example, a, a material structure like a house participates in other phenomena and converges with um, people, things, societies, and the like. Um, in the Latourian sense, uh, it, it's among these different actants that um, that verb to space um, can occur. Um, as these relations push or pull on the matter of a structure, the, that matter uh, acquires this developmental trajectory, what I'm trying to map out with this uh, wavy line um, <coughs> here. And that trajectory has some momentum to it. It's got um, a direction towards some future sedimented into the material of what it is and the array of ongoing relations around the space. Um, this future aspect of space and of relation um, is what Deleuze and what Gavin Lucas on Monday in his keynote um, talk about as the virtual. Delanda calls it possibility space. Um, the neurologist Michael Spivey calls it state space. Um, all these are ways of talking about the fact that what can be, or maybe it's more accurate to say what's coming, um, has a topology to it, has a shape. Um, and, and that would be my rejoinder to the part of Gavin's talk on Monday where he um, agonized over trying to define the limits of the virtual, the limits of what's possible. I wonder if looking for the limit of the virtual is, is less fruitful um, than looking for the shape of the virtual. I put this up here. This is uh, Michael Spivey's way of kind of visualizing a topological possibility space. If you imagine like a heavy marble being rolled into a space like this on the right with some momentum and the way it can transform that topology and the topology can divert it. <coughs> um, this is his way of modeling this sort of um, somewhat open-ended but structured um, process. So turning from something a bit <coughs> esoteric there to something a bit more concrete, um, <coughs> I want to work through these ideas with depositional sequences in chattel houses. 
Um, as many of you will know, the uh, interior surfaces of houses at Chattelhayek were plastered um, annually, sometimes multiple times a year. And this gives us a really gorgeous fine stratigraphy in the um, floors from which to parse out sequences of events, modifications, changes that occurred in that house space um, over the 50 to 90 years of, of the use life of one of these. Um, so it, this means that if you take something that in micromorphology looks like this with layers of just a few millimeters thick, if you take that single context, your Harris matrix ends up looking something like this. Um, that's the top part of it. it. Continues, it continues, it continues um, like that. Um, and so this really fine stratigraphy is, is a fantastic resource to look at relatively short term engagements between people in space um, and how these add up and form trajectories and, and really take on a shape over time, a temporal structure. If we try to break it down into events, little patches of stratigraphy in the, in the house that um, represent one of these engagements, some of them are fairly intuitive, readily understandable. Um, if, if we come in and say, OK, that's the construction of a domed oven there. That's the burial of an infant. That's um, a fairly common feature. The pit is dug, and a bunch of obsidian pieces are um, buried within it. We can call it an obsidian cache. Um, uh, that doesn't challenge us too terribly much. Um, the problem is if you start relying on that intuition for categorizing deposits and start categorizing them in, in a very static way um, of this is in itself a burial, um, and now I'm going to go look for all the other burials on the site. Um, is that in the bottom right a, a burial? Is it? Uh, an expensive purchase? Is it, uh, the, you know, what, what do you call a very shallow pit in which an arm and a leg have been deposited? Um, is this a cache of stalactites? These are just two stalactites that happen to be in, in a packing layer on top of the floor. Um, you very quickly start having a proli proliferating list of kinds of deposits um, that's not terribly useful to work with. So it's not that there's n no difference among these, obviously. It's just that it's really unclear how that difference is structured at Chattel Bay, if there's such a diversity of things deposited in houses. Um, and so um, I have a complicated relationship with this paper. Nakamura and Pels looked at some of the um, most uh, astonishing of these deposits um, and, and came to the conclusion that they're magical acts of some sort, and, and I don't know that I buy the um, diagnosis, but I do buy the remedy. They said that uh, when you've got this baffling um, assortment of, of types of deposit, it's best not to ask what it is so much as when it is, um, and, and to look for that structured difference in time rather than um, in, in static nature. So a way I am working on, on trying to put some temporal structure to these things it is sequential association rules analysis. Um, this is essentially a data mining approach. Um, it's based on very simple set algebra. You can diagram most of the process with Venn diagrams. Um, would take a little bit too long for me to do that now and would probably be very boring, but the math behind it is quite simple and it makes it fairly accessible, I think. Um, so essentially the process is um, if we feed in these three very generic series of events in, into an association rules um, algorithm, it's going to pick out um, connections between the qualities of, of events that occur sequentially over time. So we pick out the fact that where A occurs, G eventually occurs either sooner or later in, in these three series. Um, and, and you can think of similarly looking for connections like that in archaeological sequences where um, either similar events or a similar series of events occur um, in a number of stratigraphic sequences over time, looking at, at, at a big population of sequences like these. Um, 
one of the most exciting things about association rules for me is that it really does engage um, meaningfully with all this talk of possibility space that, that I sketched out earlier very um, abstractly and, and tries to put a method to it. Um, the null hypothesis in association rules analysis is effectively that any chattel uh, the possibility space for any chattel house at any moment um, included every kind of depositional event that ever happened at chattel um, that one thing randomly led on to another, that there's no structure of what leads on to what else. Um, and association rules seeks to kind of look through the real data to assess and, and try and put some numbers to how much the reality of these sequences diverges from that expectation, um, to what extent things do lead on to other things in this, uh, a couple of events predict that um, certain future events are much more likely than others. So if we come back to our example real quick, um, if, if you feed this and, and a bunch more series like it into an association rules algorithm, you get um, what's called a rule, or I think of it more as a proposition out of it. Um, given a sketchy archaeological example um, for something concrete, but um, it's a bit baffling. We can break it down. Um, it's saying that a series of events, in this case one event, um, that event has the quality A, uh, will tend to be followed by a series of events containing an event with the quality G. Um, so something like in a stratigraphic sequence where you have an adult burial, you're going to tend eventually to have um, the floor painted red. Um, it's worth noting there's no reason this has to be a single event. We can uh, string a proposition together um, really as long as we want of, of um, how complicated a sequence leads on to how complicated a, a following sequence. Um, and we can play around with the parameters of, of that phrase followed by. We can say, uh, was it followed immediately by something else? Um, are, are we looking for relations that are followed shortly thereafter by, or, or would we include something that happened way, way, way down the line, 100 years down the line, um, as following, and, and start to trace out the length across which associations occur. Um, and, and then it will spit back a, a number of metrics with, with very um, opaque names to them that are really very simple. Um, Again, you can do this with Venn diagrams, proportion of sequences where the whole thing occurs, proportion of the sequences where the first half occurs, um, and then the second half occurs, um, which just get at ways of, of assessing the strength of these connections and, and how um, non-random they are. Um, so as I, as I don't have a great deal of real data to play around with, um, now and show you the process. Thanks. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit at the end of, about the free play that goes into any assessment of possibility space, a, a, as Gavin noted on Monday. Um, the idea of toying with alternatives, toying with um, things that could be important in, in shaping a future. Um, and, and that's really built into um, the kind of analysis I'm trying to do and, and what I'm trying to do. Um, the process of association rules analysis is, is very much um, starts as you code your data, decide what constitutes an event in, in your data, what kind of event that is, what qualities it has. And so you can layer on, on different levels and kinds of, of specific meaning. We could say that code these all as instances of the embedding of things in house floors, whether it's embedding a baby in the house floor or embedding a stalactite in the floor. Um, we could say, let's check if these are different, they're human bodies, does, does that change the effect they have on the possibility space for a house over time? Um, we could say, is this different? Because it's not actually buried in a pit, it's, it's included in a construction event that's already ongoing. So you can play with, with the qualities of events in, in that more static way of, of looking at them and, and try to see where there are salient differences there. 
and you can also by by toying with the parameters of, of the suppositions or propositions that you um, explore um, look at temporal patterns as well the kind of layering on or iteration of qualities um, that occur in space over time as, as one deposit comes after another and and are these additive to what extent are they additive um, does a deposit that happens in a space a hundred years after another add to the meaning or, or has the former one been forgotten um, is it no longer relevant um, all three of these deposits happen in the same space over the course of maybe um, 30 40 years um, the baby is buried in the initial construction of a platform uh, the platforms unraised and, and these stones are buried in it and then the platforms got these fantastic kind of ribbony brickworky paintings on the front of it um, and so by playing around with these ideas and also ideas like the instability or abnormality of sequences um, what I'm hoping to do is, is really explore how space unfolds over time and how that has a future to it a future with a shape um, and, and how the past helps shape that future um, to give a sense of, of presence as being um, contingent not just backwards but also forwards um, so I find this all very exciting um, it but as it's really early in, in this work I, I very much invite any comments or questions so when we come to the question session you have on this uh, any concerns um, or, or caveats um, would really help me think through what we can do with something like this or what we maybe oughtn't try to do with something like this and uh, without further ado I'll turn it over to Malcolm.